Okay, welcome. We are live on LinkedIn Live celebrating Women's History Month. Uh, glad you all join us. And um, we're just delighted to be here. And I uh, wanted to start just, I'll have each Katie, Angela, and Lavinia introduce themselves in just a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and why. And um, of course, I am the president of CDR Companies, and I've been in this role since 1998. I uh, love the work we do. We have assessments. We do executive and leadership development, team development, and even things like succession planning and selection screening with our assessments. And then recently, one thing you may have heard some buzz about is we've developed an online avatar coaching system. We can actually have a debrief of your assessments via an avatar. We didn't do this to replace executive coaching because that's so important, but it's to reach the many people who will never have deep assessments in coaching, say the bottom 75% of an organization. But anyway, today is not about CDR. It's to celebrate women in leadership. And I couldn't be more delighted to have this panel. And it's actually, you may have read, my two daughters and my daughter-in-law. And the reason we've called this second generation women's leadership is that I consider myself among those in first generation um, because I was 21 years old when the Pregnancy Act went into effect, which actually meant women could no longer be fired for getting pregnant or for being in their childbearing years. Now, I know there were a lot of women leaders before that and pioneers. I'm not to, not to take away from that, but the doors were really opened for us in 1979. So I'm a first generation, and then we have these wonderful millennial women who are second generation. So what I'm hoping to do in a way of closing the door on the month of Women's History Month is to look to the future of women in leadership. And I thought, what if, for me, there couldn't be a better way than hearing from um, my daughters and daughter-in-law, because that, of course, I am biased, but they've done some amazing things. So with that, what I'd like to do is um, have each of them introduce themselves, tell you about what they do and how they got there, why they decided to do what they're doing. Um, Katie, I'll start with you. You're at my top uh, right here. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mom. Um, so I, I'm currently at Constellation Brands. And we're a total beverage alcohol organization. You may know the names of Corona, Modelo, uh, Svedka Vodka, Robert Mondavi, the Prisoner Wine Company. Those are a few of our brands. But I'm, the, I'm over in the operations side of the house uh, in Wine Spirits. And I'm the vice president of procurement, direct to consumer operations, and NPD. And I've been with Constellation for about four years now. Um, and I've spent the majority of my career within operations. I did take a little detour uh, for about four years within marketing and, and recognize that I'm not a marketeer, but appreciate uh, the commercial side of the business. Um, and so I've spent some time at, at different at large corporations in different capacities, um, got my degree in chemical engineering and got my MBA uh, uh, recently in 2017. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Great. Thanks, Katie. And Angela. Um. All right, great. Um, thanks, Mom, as well. Um, so I am Nancy's other daughter. Uh, my name is Angela Parsons. I am in Philadelphia. We're coming to you live from many different time zones right now. But I am in Philadelphia, and I am a partner in a certified women-owned business of about 60, a little over 60 people called Accelerate. We're what's called an RPO, or Recruitment Process Outsourcing Company. So we work with companies that their internal recruiting teams don't have the bandwidth to expand fast enough and handle all the requisitions they have on their plate. So they use us to help them during high growth periods or help them with areas of you know certain jobs that they're not experts in. Um, I'm super proud of our organization. Uh, through the pandemic, it wasn't ideal to be a uh, having a large scale, or, or, excuse me, a large volume recruiting company when nobody was hiring. But so we scaled from about 60 before the pandemic down to 10 and now are back up to 60. So super proud of, of the past year. Um, and I think that's a uh, great in, enough of an intro for me. Great, great. Thanks, Angela. And Lavinia. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I'm Lavinia Pavla Parsons. I'm a gynecologic oncologist here in Houston. I work for UT Health. And um, I know probably people don't really know what a gynecologic oncologist is, but I'm a women's physician doctor um, that specializes on in on all gynecologic cancers, such as ovarian cancer, cervical cancer. Um, we, I treat patients from 
all those types of cancer, giving them chemo and doing complex surgeries to also very complex benign GYN uh, syndromes. So um, yeah, that's what I can say a little bit by myself. Yeah, and Lavinia, so what, what brought you to that? I mean, that's a, what brought you to that uh, line of work? inspired you yeah yeah so um i mean i've always uh you know I've, i don't have any physicians in my family but as since a little kid i've always wanted to be a physician and my mission's always been wanting to help people as um uh as an adult and so i went into medicine for that reason and surgery has always been a you know a desire for me to continue doing in my field I got to do some work at the NIH for a year and, you know, um, NIH is known for cancer and I got to spend a great amount of time doing research and um, working with those types of patients. And so that really inspired me to combine surgery and cancer together and work with women, especially um, because I felt very passionate about um, women's health and women's causes. And, and it's just a lovely population to work with and it's very inspiring to be with them. Oh, great, great. Thank you. Um, so, so my next question is, of course, I, I know your stories, obviously. Um, hopefully I am part of your stories. But uh, this one is, um, in terms of getting to where you are today or in, in life, we all encounter different challenges, different obstacles along the way, or we might have setbacks or, or what have you. Um, can you share with us each maybe a particular challenge or obstacle that was pretty tough for you to got to get through or, or how you how you got through it and what you learned from it. How about that? Katie, would you mind starting? Sure, yeah. So one of mine, it wasn't really a challenge, but I would say it was somewhat of competing priorities. You know, um, I'm very driven by nature, um, pretty competitive, played sports all growing up, um, you know, from when I was very little. Obviously, you guys know that, um, considering we were part of the journey together. Um, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to continue doing was continue my uh, progressing in my career. But I also wanted to go back and get my MBA. And then also, you know, I was recently married and my husband and I wanted to start a family. Um, and, you know, life doesn't stop. Um, so we, we partnered together and figured out how we could do it all at the same time. So, um, we did that, you know, at the time I was with General Electric and they were very supportive of what we were living in Seattle. So I actually flew down every other weekend to San Francisco to, um, be in the Wharton executive MBA program down there. Um, and honestly, you know, my husband also at the same time was in a very demanding career in the tech industry. Um, but, you know, lo and behold, three months into the, pro the two-year program, I became pregnant um, and was able to continue the program with the support of my husband. And I can assure you it was long and arduous and involved a lot of communication, probably over communication um, in order to, to see it through. But I, it was such a rewarding experience and I wouldn't change it for anything. And honestly, I, you know, the, the, one of the coolest parts about it was I was able to do it um, and continue doing everything I was and also graduate with honors. So I'm super proud of the experience. And like I said, wouldn't change it for, for the world. Great, great. And what I remember too about that was, wasn't it that you only missed one weekend? Here you're having a baby and you only yes. missed one weekend. Isn't that true? Yeah. I did. I, I ended up, I skipped one class weekend where I, you know, we typically fly down every other weekend and I, and then I came back on the, the fourth weekend. So, um, yeah, it was, it was fun times for certain. <laughs> Breastfeeding was very interesting too along the way. I learned all the nooks and crannies in the airports and in all the restaurants and everything. So it was, it was a very interesting experience, but you know what, like I said, um, when you're driven and you've got a great partner in life, um, you figure out ways to make it happen. Good. good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Angela, how about you? Um, so besides obviously a year of a pandemic that would be commonplace for everybody to have had, experienced a lot of challenges, especially as a small business owner, uh, mine's a little bit more personal and a, a little less professional. Um, when I was 20, just turned 23 years old, um, so over a decade ago, um, I was in a, a very serious car accident that quite frankly probably should have ended my life. Um, I was really lucky to survive it and had a lot of people say, um, you know, you won't, you won't ever walk again. You won't ever uh, wear high heels again, which is part of my mantra. You won't ever run again. Um, and I really, you know, took that as 
just kind of my ethos in life is I love when people tell me I can't do something because that gives me so much intrinsic motivation to just knock it out of the park. And, you know, I'm happy to say, you know, over a decade later, many, many surgeries later, um, I do all of those things and really have relatively zero pain and after effect. And sometimes it just seems like a very distant dream. Um, but when I, you know, kind of do think back on, wow, like that could have really knocked me down for essentially the rest of my life. Um, happy that it didn't. And again, taught me just how much, um, you know, mental strength that I can have when I need to. And, and this helps me a lot in life in that regard. Great. Thanks for sharing that. That was, that was a really tough time. So really proud of you for that. And Lavinia, how about if you share with us? Um, yeah, like, um, as you've noticed, we all have many struggles in our lives and they're small, large, they're just different. And, um, I guess, you know, I guess a struggle of my life could be mostly attributed to like how I grew up. Um, my family immigrated from India, um, you know, in the early 1980s, they left hot, sunny, humid India and comes, <laughs> came into like Washington state where they were met with like four feet of snow, didn't know how to handle that, left their entire family, left everything they knew, their culture, um, their comfort. And they came to this country just to um, get better opportunities for them. And, you know, my dad's a professor. And so this was just an ideal place for him to be. And they continue to stay here and continue to give these potential opportunities for their own children. My mom was raised us basically on her own. My dad worked all the time and uh, she raised three children and she's definitely um, done a fabulous job, I might have to say, but you know, I think most people feel that way. Um, we're all successful in our lives and um, our family definitely put in um, the ethical behaviors. For, I mean, the morals behind us is hardworking and determination. We can do whatever we can in whatever setting you are in. And I, it was hard growing up in the Midwest being one of the only brown kids in my class, but you know, I was always. I had family around me, they always supported me and I was very driven and my family, you know, definitely encouraged that and fostered that in me. And so I really attribute a lot of my success to my family. Great, great, thank you. Thank you all. That was, thanks for sharing because I know that goes a little deeper than some of these normal conversations. Um, so, so I'm gonna make it simple now, okay? This is something, well, maybe simple, it's shorter anyway. Um, so in three words uh, or less, can you describe your leadership style? Katie, since I'm kind of rotating around the way I see you on the screen. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm not real good with coloring in the line. So three words is really hard for me. Um, I would say servant leadership and work hard, play hard are two of my like key um, uh you know, areas that I focus in on, you know, I like to roll up my sleeves, get up, get in the trenches when needed. Um, but truly I succeed when my team succeed. And I like wholeheartedly believe that, but I also appreciate and stop to celebrate the wins. And I fortunate, I'm fortunate enough to be in an industry, um, that recognizes that. So it's, it's a pretty fun time. Okay, good, good. So what was your rule breaker score, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's referring to our assessments. I'm just kidding. Okay, Angela, how about you? I'm also, I'm going to add an article adjective in just four words, um, and I'm going to give credit where credit is due. So Sarah Blakely has this um, concept of freedom within a framework, which I think is really powerful, and how I uh, definitely employ that with my team. Um, you know, well, I'm not here to babysit you, I'm not here to micromanage you, but I'm here to empower you and give you, you know, that extra boost when you need to. But this is, you know, our process and a, a metrics driven organization to be able to be successful on our projects. But you have a lot of freedom here at Accelerate, but it's within a, an organized framework. And that's, again, how I'll manage you or, or lead you as well. Great, great. Thank you. And Lavinia? Um, yeah, so I would say my leadership style is very direct. Um, you know what I want um, when I usually <laughs> let you know. Um, I'm empathetic, I feel like, because for most of my um, individuals that I work with, I've been in your shoes, so I know exactly how it feels. Um, and then I would say the thing that I've tried to change 
for me, from what I've learned from my superiors is that I'm democratic in the sense that I allow them to make their own decisions on their own and we come up to a group decision because medicine is art and I feel like it's there's not a single way to do medicine. Great, great. Well, thank you. That was, that was really good. Appreciate that. Although nobody stayed within the words, but it made it so much better. <laughs> um, okay, so this, this may put you on the spot a little bit, but what is the, um, the greatest feedback or compliment that you've received maybe from a boss or a colleague or a customer? Katie, do you oh, want so, to start? Start with me, okay. Um, you know, I, I've been leading teams for, you know, going on over 15 years now. And along the way, there's been, you know, ups and downs like any anyone else has, has experienced. But, you know, I... I had a uh, woman who um, worked for me that um, saw me kind of step up and, and speak up for myself in a situation and came back to me later and just told me how inspired she was um, by how I stepped into the uncomfortable situation, took ownership, asked for what I wanted. And, you know, uh, she felt that it was courageous and inspirational and it was, um, it was pretty exciting to hear that, you know, she said that regardless of the outcome of whatever happened, you know, you made a difference. And now I'm going to think th about things a little bit differently in my own, in my own way of working. So, you know, that, that if I can just help, you know, one person, one woman be, um, speak up more, um, I, I feel like I've been successful as a leader and, and that was like really exciting and, and fun to hear. Great. Great. That is powerful. Thank you. How about you, Angela? Um, well, I get this a lot and I take it as a huge badge of honor, but I get, where did you come from? <laughs> I, I, you know, I really, um, dissuade a lot of uh, misperceptions about me. Just, I mean, I work with so many private equity companies, um, to really help, you know, their portfolio companies grow. And that's a, as I say, a very male pale, stale and often frail dominated world. And, you know, I come in there with my blonde little self and, you know, we're talking business or we're talking sports or we're talking, you know, music. And I like to see myself as very um, multifaceted and, you know, things that I can draw um, knowledge from and stuff like that. And they're often um, pretty, pretty amazed at, you know, the depth of, of what I can discuss and how I can discuss it. And again, when they had a probably a, a, a wrong and inaccurate misperception from the moment that I walked in. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Angela. How about you, Lavinia? Um, you know, it's always great to hear comments from my superiors be like, oh, you're a wonderful surgeon. You're amazing. But I felt like the most um, meaningful um, compliments came from actually my residents. And they're usually my underlings and they're the ones that I teach. And um, it, it's very humbling when they come back to me and they're like, you're like the mo most like enthusiastic, joyful, like wonderful surgeon to work with. And I think that's a huge compliment because it comes from, I work in a very male dominated field. It's not a warm and fuzzy area and it's nice to have, um, and it's a very intimidating field. So the underlings really hate working with us because we're intense people and uh, it's just very um, nerve wracking for them. So it's really nice when individuals can come up to me and be like, you know, I've really, really loved working with you because you've made it enjoyable and you've taught me a lot and I've absorbed it, which is wonderful. Great. Right. No, that's valid. Just, to add that, um, just a little note that, you know, that's a commonality amongst us for us. We're all, um, although my company specifically is what I call an estrogen fest a lot of women, but I mean, I definitely work in a, a very male dominated world. And I think we all do. And I know mom, your background in energy was, was very male dominated at a time when, you know, completely almost male dominated, I would say. Right. Right. Just for, like, for the, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know my early background, I was in HR, worked at a, a shipyard and then I was promoted to a coal mine out in Wyoming and then to pipelines in Oklahoma and other areas. But yeah. So thanks for mentioning that. Yes. Yeah, I was the only woman in that space. So um, learned how to adapt and deal, had setbacks, but kept moving forward. So anyway, good. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll, I'll move to that. So um, this is just something, it's always something we think about with Women's History Month and, and uh, even with diversity and inclusion and many of the things that are going on now and the challenges that we face. And in, I think in many cases, we're finally giving these things a fair look and a good look to try to make changes and inroads. So I'm really excited about that. 
But I, I do want to ask you, now, of course, I was first generation, so I obviously being the only and in those, those tough industries. So I want to ask you this, you know, um, while you've had great careers and everything, have you ever faced or witnessed, may not be you or anything, um, some gender-based concerns or problems in leadership? And, you know, what happened? And, you know, just give us a little bit of history on what you've seen and what do you think we could be doing differently? How's that? Katie, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. I, and I, I can honestly say, fortunately, I've been lucky in that I haven't encountered any uh, overt gender-based concerns myself. Um, but I will say, like, you know, of course, I have experienced challenges throughout my career, you know, since I started managing uh, and leading teams those years ago. Um, and, and some could be considered, you know, rites of passage, if, if, if you will. Um, and so mainly over the years and in, in almost every single role that I've been in, um, I've had to assert my role within the organization. So meaning prove that I deserve a seat at the table. I've earned uh, the, to be a part of the conversations and decision-making processes. And honestly, sometimes those conversations aren't always easy and frankly can be quite uncomfortable. Um, and, but also knowing this, I b also do believe it to be my role now, especially, uh, to look out for others, especially women and try to be their advocate. So I, you know, try to speak up on behalf and, and make sure that the right people are in the room and ha making decisions. And, um, cause sometimes we, we, uh, you know, we miss that and, you know, uh, it's, it's been a, a great learning experience for me, but it honestly, it's, I'm, I'm also pretty direct. Um, sometimes it's really it's really difficult to have those conversations. So okay, great, thank you, Angela. Um, so again, mine is more about just um, as our company is a small business, and I think a lot of women out there in small business and also um, minorities experience this too from a banking perspective. Um, you really need capital to help you grow. We're completely organically cash drop company. Um, we don't have any outside investment, and so one of the things that's pivotal to any small business is a line of credit. We're extremely profitable and, again, have been in the black for our entire 17 years in business. But when we go out to get a line of credit, and especially at the revenue point that we're at, we're faced with, you know, a tons of obstacles. You have to put your house up for collateral, all these things that if I were a 23-year-old Caucasian tech guru, I could walk up and get, you know, a $2 million line of credit with virtually no collateral on the other side. And that's based on algorithms and banking for default rates and stuff like that. So I'm really a huge proponent of helping the banking system understand and be able to give, you know, those loans at uh, lower interest rates and lines of credit and things like that, because you do need, you know, cash to oftentimes grow. And so that's something that um, my partner, Emily, and I have experienced, um, a couple of times and again just very disproportionate with what other types of businesses that other some even not even post revenue were able to get you know huge lines of credit compared to us that's you know always been profitable so that's one you know thing that i would say that it was I, I think was pretty gender biased and you know again pretty was significant to our company at that time okay no that's great that's really helpful and that's and that's still true so appreciate that so and i'm in the small business side too so i'm with you on that it's not easy so yeah, you know. Okay, Lavinia, how about you? Um, so I feel like uh, medicine's very old school. It's um, it's very backwards in like um, progression, and you know, like you know, I know Katie works for a very progressive company, but it's not the case in medicine necessarily, especially as a trainee. It's uh, very uh, limited, and my experiences being as a woman, it has been very like it hasn't been very pleasant, let's say during, especially during a trainee. I mean, as a trainee now, as like my own boss, I mean, I have my own, I have a boss, but I have a little bit more space to do a lot more things than maybe I would have as a trainee. But at that time, you're not supposed to speak up. You're not supposed to ask questions. You're not supposed to challenge. I mean, I was told like during my first pregnancy, I had two and a half weeks of maternity leave and came back straight to work. And, you know, I didn't blink an eye, didn't think that was abnormal. And like looking back on it, that was crazy. Why did I come back in two and a half weeks? Um, you know, things like, you know, going through training and like looking for jobs, people being like, oh, she's not going to be reliable because she has family at home. Like, how is she going to be able to stay and work at night and 
to go to the OR, she's going to run out and get out. Or being efficient was looked upon as being um, maybe like not um, really intently looking at the situation, whereas being efficient and just being able to get tasks done properly was looked as a negative thing. So I think really having a family and being female in medicine has definitely a huge lots of consequences that, you know, people are bringing it up, but it's very slow to change. Right, right. And on that, I just want to mention, too, this obviously women in leadership has always been, for me and my business, you know, a keen interest, an area of research. I've written two books on the subject. And the reason I did, honestly, and what I'm hearing you all saying, especially loving you, you know, just the things that happen at work. Um, I was pretty upset by the fact that here I am, first generation, the, the doors were open for all of us women in 1979. Yet there's only about 6% women that have made it as CEOs. And so it really, uh, you know, pushed me to look at, well, why is this happening? And we were able to, and I, I will show, you know, my last book that they're all familiar with, you know, we, we found what we think is the root cause in, in many cases on what's holding women back. And part of it is how they cope under stress. So that's one part of it. But the other big part of it is perceptions and how women are judged or treated differently. And just let me give you one quick example, then we'll move on. So like, and think of like, you know, what Lavinia shared and everything, or when a woman has a risk and a man shares the same risk and risks are ineffective coping strategies or ways we sometimes react under stress. So if she's like, let's say an egotist and he's an egotist, well, he's just a pretty assertive guy, right? She's a bitch. I mean, the language around and the way we frame how we look at different people and that, that applies to both women and minority populations too. It's so, so we have to, in my line of work, we help people take a different lens on how they view talent so that it is objective and we can get rid of some of those filters. But that's enough about, but when you talk about women in leadership and that's why I have uh, my daughters and Lavinia here, uh, it's because it is, it is so compelling to me. And I think I'm just kind of, I'm a little shocked and heartbroken in a way that we're not doing better this, this many years later. So yeah, you feel like it's part of my job to help us get better at that. Um, now, uh, so speaking about assertiveness, right? <laughs> um, obviously, do you, um, do you consider yourself pretty assertive and, um, and even bossy at times? And tell me how that works. Just talk about your assertiveness and your, your bossiness. And I say that um, in a kind way, in a supportive way. <laughs> Uh, I'll start. I would say the short answer is yes. I mean, let's be honest. You guys know I was, we were growing up oldest of four kids. It's, I was sort of predestined to be a little bossy, but really the, the nature is, um, you know, I'm driven. I like to get things done. Um, my teams know that. So I'll continue to, to push and push until we get to a, a resolution. And so if you want to call me bossy, I'll own that thing all day. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Angela. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that. I mean, look, my assertiveness just coincides with my impatience. You know, I'm happy to do it myself and I like things done my way and yesterday. Like, that's what I say. So keep it moving. And again, you know, again, if, if you're uh, faint of heart, then you're probably not going to be, be really do a great job with it or you not really like my leadership style, so to speak. Because again, you know, especially in the small business environment in a very fast paced environment, you've you got to keep things moving and time kills deals. And as a person that really looks over, you know, the sales and business development aspect of our company, we've got to keep things moving all the time and address problems with our current clients. And it's just my personality though, both professionally and personally, pretty assertive. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I would say that's putting, that's a little bit of a, uh, Putting it lightly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. okay. And Lavinia. Yeah, I would have to agree. I'm pretty assertive. I um, I like things done my way, and um, it has to be done immediately. Um, not like, okay, let me finish this task and get to it. No, I need you to walk and get it done. Um, and I think that's just, you know, like my mentality. Like I'm in the OR, and if that doesn't happen, then that's minutes on this patient's life. So I. That, that's everything in my life and you know sometimes my husband's like 
you know, I'm not your like scrub tech in the OR. Like you can wait for a minute. And I was like, I don't think so. But life is keep moving. Can you guys imagine game night at our house? Wow. <laughs> well, so that is a question I had actually. And I'm going to tell a story after y'all. I wanted to ask you to, to kind of lighten things up just a little bit, and then we'll get back to the more serious topics. So we do game night, like we are games. When we all get together, we do different kinds of games. So I want to know from each of you, what is your favorite game and why, and what do you think you're really good at versus maybe something you're not so good at? Um, so for <laughs> me, you know, I like that we can even get like cutthroat competitive when we're playing horse. Like, it's the most <laughs> benign game ever known. <laughs> and we can just get, like, trash-talking, saucy. Um, I really I really enjoy that. Like, so anything, like, physical. But, you know, obviously, like, Trivial Pursuit is a, is a big fan favorite uh, of mine. Um, because everybody just gets so competitive. And, oof, it's, it's fun. It's good times. <laughs> so I'm going to tell a story about uh, my sister-in-law, who I love so much. Um, so one time, my brother was dating... A girl that couldn't keep up with the assertiveness of the Parsons household. And Lavinia and I were playing Taboo, which is my favorite game, by the way. And it's because it's really about the clue givers is really how it determines, you know, how well you're going to do. And we were given some phenomenal clues. I mean, these were knock it out of the park, slow pitch softballs. And this girl was just not getting it. And Lavinia and I, without even saying a word, just looked over each other like she's never going to last here. And she did but uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember that? I do. I distinctly. I wasn't even married to Matt yet. It was like on your mom's and dad's like anniversary, 25th anniversary party. Yeah. I totally remember that. And you were like, "Who is she?" I guess I've been this like quiet person that you guys didn't realize I was. No, I mean, I knew just like without even, we, there was no verbal communication. We just looked at each other like, uh-uh. You know, uh, she's got one month max left in this. Relationship. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, funny. I think I would have to say Cranium is um, my favorite. I think we, we all have a pretty good test with that. And I think like um, watching people just do things that they hate doing, like, you know, like Nancy pretending she's a penguin on fire. Like that. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, that was uh, that was bad. I like. I love when um mom competitiveness gets so overwhelming that she just has to quit the game if she's not winning. <laughs> Wait, now my favorite though, and Katie wasn't there for this one, but we remember we had the group and we played. Uh, I think it's called Cool Cool Cats and Ass Hats or whatever, and it was I. And what happens is you get to punish the other team if they don't do so well or something and with making them sing or dance. And I honestly, I've never laughed so hard in my life, you know, and um, it, it was just, it was really fun. So, you know, we do have a great time and, and I, I like cranium, but I don't like trivial pursuit because I don't have that kind of memory on all those things. I, I kind of have a random memory. So anyway. <laughs> But no, we have so much fun. The other one I would mention, and our our husbands are all really competitive too. So, we, you know, I have, have two sons, of course, my husband, Bill, and then Jeff, you know, Katie's husband. So they're all competitive too. So it makes for wild times when we all get together. Um, and the other one is outdoor, if we get to play water, volleyball. Oh, my goodness. Watch out for Matt. Yes, and Andrew. <laughs> so, there yeah. you meet the father or meet the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and we're we're delighted. I also have a daughter-in-law that's not with us now. She's a um, she's a stay-at-home mom right now, but she's also very competitive because she was a college soccer player. So she's so we're really happy with Rachel. <laughs> she's not on the call now. Okay. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, here's when we go back to serious now for a minute. We may go back to something fun. But what is the what is the key advice that you would give aspiring women uh, coming out of college or looking for careers or even on, on uh, coming into leadership? What advice do you have for, for young women coming up through the their uh, early parts of their career? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so mine is really two parts. Um, and the first, you have to have the first before you can get to the second. 
Um, first is work hard, over deliver on expectations, surprise and delight. That way, when the second happens, there's no question. And then the second is ask for what you want. Tell them what you want. Speak up for yourself. Because at the end of the day, uh, only the only true advocate for you is you. Don't expect somebody on the outside to see your worth. And if you've success, successfully done number one, that is exceeding on those expectations, convincing the right stakeholders of number two is that much easier. Great, great. That's really good. Thank you, Katie. Angela, would you? Mine very much parallels that, and I'm going to come directly from the recruiting perspective. Um, and this is advice that I would give somebody no matter any point in their career. And I think it really leads into, Mom, your all of your research and data, what it's showing on the leadership side, is ask for more. Because you better bet that your male counterparts are asking for more. And I'm talking strictly about compensation. And that is how we've gotten to the pay gaps that you see across this country for so many jobs. Because what happens is when you are going from your first job to your second job, they say, how much were you making? And that's how the offer is created based on what you were making before. When a male is offered a job, he has no problem typically going back. And it's like, what the hell? What, what's, what's the uh, worst that's going to happen if I say, can you give me... $5,000 more. And likely they will. Women are so excited. They've already plotted what their first 90 days are like. You know, they're ready to just get going. But you extrapolate that over the course of a career. Now you've got $25,000 to $100,000 pay gaps in the same exact job because it went from a $5,000 pay gap to a $20,000 pay gap. And it goes on like that. Because again, the recruiters and the HR team, when they're formulating the offer, is looking back at your past comp and then giving you your offer to get you. And so you'll have, you know, again, if you never ask for more, that pay gap's just going to increase and increase and increase. And so, you know, ask for more. And there's no harm in asking because if they want you and have already extended you an offer, they're not going to rescind that offer just because you asked for a little more money. They just might say no, but it's, there's no harm in asking. Okay. Great, great advice. Thank you. And Lavinia, what would you say? I mean, it kind of all falls along what Katie and Angela have said, but honestly, reach for the stars. Like, I feel like no goal is too high and all your, and there's, you're going to reach it and you have to just persevere and just, you know, put down, put down your head and work hard to get to those goals. It might, you might stumble a little, you might have some roadblocks, but if you have a goal and you want to succeed to get to it all you have you just keep working until you get to it it just might take different paths to get there now a direct path but another yeah. fork in the road you know great great and here's here's one um i just want to ask you all this you, you know you all have a lot of demands in your life and you know katie has two small children one on the way and lavinia has got two small and angela works like nobody else i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and she plays hard too but so I just want to know, how do you all manage those things? How do you keep your, you know, the family and all that to help women understand? How do you juggle it? How do you make it work? How do you pull it together? Because it's not easy. Katie, did you yeah, for me, you know, it's, it's a, a really great support system. Obviously, my husband is my partner and we do everything in life together. And so he also has a very demanding career. So we... You know, we, because we live in California, we're not close to family. Um, we have a lot of, you know, pseudo family members, right? So our friends that are our family that, that help us along the way. And we, you know, we do have a live in au pair that helps with our children um, as well to, so that we can um, continue building our careers and things like that. So it's definitely having a, a support structure in place and, and knowing when to ask for help. Yeah. Um, it is a big part of it too. I know that I can call on my mom at any time and if she, she'll come out and, 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 you know, support us if we need to, but just building that support system. How about you, Angela? So, um, first I'll say, you know, I'm constantly in awe of my other family members and also just other people I know with, with small children, but really, um, any age children and, and how they do it. Um, I, cause I myself don't have children and I want to be very forthright that that's, a very cognizant choice because I do want a life of working hard and then be able to play very hard. And I kind of had to come to terms with myself that I'm not really, I'm so kind of a, in love with that lifestyle that I have that freedom, that it is something that I don't know how you can do it all. Um, just based on, you know, what do you want to prioritize? So, you know, I, 
And I think there's a lot of women out there too, especially when they've dedicated so much of their um, effort into their careers and things like that. And they're like, how am I going to fit in, you know, kids? And then they get on this, you know, crazy timeline that just stresses them out on when they can do everything in life. So I just think, you know, you have to, I, I come from a family, obviously, with what my mom's uh, profession is, is to really do a lot of self-reflection and self-assessment on what truly makes you happy and, uh, you know, make sure that you are never stopping to prioritize, you know, your, with your family first, if you're, your job, you know, whatever it is, and just be very honest with yourself. Great. Great. Thank you. Great. Loving you. So, um, you know, a, a village, it, it takes a village to great. Um, have a great family and and that is a hundred percent true to me um you know my family has been such a huge support system it starts with my husband he's a wonderful wonderful husband that and a father that is still works a very demanding job actually more hours than me nowadays but very demanding but he is there for our children at all times he takes care of the house he 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 does so many things that's so vital to keep this family going. Um, and then of course I have my mother-in-law that lives here in Houston with us. So that's, and, and Bill, my father-in-law too. So that's amazing. And my family who lives in Missouri, my mom and dad will come in a drop of like a dime to just come and anytime, anytime I need anything, they will come and spend weeks, months, whatever I need just to help me and my family get through what I need to do. Um, and so that's super important. And every day we have our kids go to school, but you know, they come home at three. How am I supposed to get out of work or my husband needs to get out of work? So we of course have a nanny. There's no way we couldn't have done it without our wonderful nanny with this whole situation. So it, it takes a village and you know, everybody that is there within this circle is family and no matter if they're real blood or not, they're family to us. Right. And, and that's wonderful. And I just want to pitch in too, because Katie and Angela know this. And of course, Lavin, you knows it, but they experienced it. I was lucky enough, Bill and I, we have four kids, you know, two boys, two girls. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have my father, their grandfather, live with us for 14 years. So he was our rock. He loved to cook. So he would cook and drive them to school. They didn't like to take the bus. They wanted to be driven by grandpa all the time. So it really, so we kind of had, uh, it was like an Uncle Charlie in the house. Uh, he was a big Philadelphia Eagles fan, you know, uh, but we loved him and it was wonderful. My mother had passed away pretty young. So he, it just worked out perfectly in our fa family for my dad and his dog ballpark to come, you know, live with us and be part of the family and help Bill and I so much. So we've been, we were blessed that way. I mean, and, um, and I think we helped his life be very full as well. So he wasn't there in Philadelphia alone he moved out to Oklahoma with us so anyway that's kind of how do, everybody has a different way of trying to how do we manage it is a village it's your families your neighbors and all the rest so um okay I have one other question and this is kind of a, a self-promoting shameless plug okay are you ready <laughs> do it <laughs> What did you think of my latest book? And I'll remind you the name of it is Women Are Creating the Glass Ceiling and Have the Power to End It. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'll start. Um, I actually found it super it, it, like insightful and enlightening, honestly. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about it or dabbled in it today. You know, as leaders and professionals, you know, we all have inherent risk factors that are exacerbated when, we, when the going gets tough. Um, and it talks a lot about that. Um, and we all need to recognize what those are in ourselves and develop ways to dampen those negative effects. And so two things that I pulled from the book were really around um, women are holding themselves back, taking themselves out of the running. No one is doing it to them. Um, so it's about really being self-aware of those risks and taking responsibility for our own careers. So I thought that was nice. It wasn't this like male bashing, you know, book, you know, but it was, it was really about women taking the onus on themselves to really understand what their challenges are and how to, how to like be more nimble with them. And then the second one I wanted to point out was it's not about tokenism. Uh, that's not the answer. Um, it hinders progress for women and fosters that self-fulfilling prophecy about the lackluster capability of women in leadership. And so it just, you know, you know, I'll be, I'll admit, I've seen it in my career, um, where you know that there's a woman in a position that that probably shouldn't be, and it just hurts us all. 
Um, so it's, again, I get back to my first point. It's about knowing what our inherent risks are in our, in our, um, in, when things get tough and really um, finding ways to counteract them uh, and know what the triggers are. Um, so that I, I thought it was cool. And I actually, I shared it with my coworkers at, at Constellation Brands. I, um, we had these little monthly sessions where we each brought up a topic and, and had a, a pretty engaging conversation about it. So we all read the book, or at least I think they did. Uh, but um, no, it was a really, it was a really active, enlightening, open and honest conversation. And it just allowed, allowed for um, uh, everybody to kind of sort of get their opinions and things out. So it was a, it was a good conversation starter. Right. Great. Thanks, Katie. Angela. Yeah. So, I mean, so kind of piggyback on what she was saying, I think that the book is very um, relevant to what's going on right now, because yes, there's a lot of things that are going on from say an external um, perspective of, you know, literally having diversity initiatives and in leadership roles and things like that. But there's also, it has to be two sides of the coin where you have to take your personal accountability and really start eliminating excuses and do what you can to advocate for yourself to find the avenues that are going to get you to whatever position and whatever level you ultimately want to achieve. And so I really like that perspective of the book that it wasn't, here's all the reasons, the external reasons that you might not even be able to control that are holding you back. It was like, no, let's stop and do some self-reflection and really like, you know, understand your own career and your career progression and what might've been holding you back. And let's start changing that right now. I'm such an advocate of, of therapy um, in, in so many ways. And I think it's never too late to start therapy. And I would, would liken this to really therapy for your career, just to really start truly assessing, you know, what are your inherent risk factors? What might be holding you back and how do we help mitigate those so that you can propel yourself, um, you know, as an advocate for yourself as well. So great. Excuses. Yep. No, that's great. Thank you, Angela. And Lavinia. Yeah. So I really thought it was helpful for me because it was just very, um, you know, it obviously has several risk factors and that you could relate to and you could look through for, for myself, I was able to look through it and it gave examples and then it provided suggestions how to like overcome that or how it was viewed upon other people or from a male standpoint. And I thought that was just very interesting because like you just gave an example earlier, you know, like if you're egotistical, you or might be looked as a, just like, um, you know, kind of in a negative tone rather as a male looking as as it um, maybe positive and so I just felt like it's interesting how the um, how people view similar characteristics as it different amongst everybody and how it could be spun as more positive in a male's version um, perspective and I, I felt like it was very helpful to give hints or suggestions how to um, maneuver that great great thanks well, any, I'd like you just to give your parting thoughts before, as we wrap it up. And again, I thank all of you. This is, this was the most fun thing for me. I was so excited to have you all come on. I'm so proud of you. I love you to pieces. You know that, but any parting uh, words from each of you, Katie? No, thanks for having, uh, thanks for having me. I, this is kind of an interesting little dynamic. We've, we've uh, <laughs> never really talked in, in almost only professional capacity. So it was kind of, it was kind of fun in this way. So thanks for having me, mom. Yeah. Angela. Yeah. Thank you as well. And again, ladies out there ask for more seriously. I can't yes. say it enough because it really helps, you know, it, it helps, it helps the women above you. It helps women below you. If we all ask for more and we're all in this together, um, so please do that. Great, great, thank you. And loving you. Thank you so much, Nancy, for including me in this. This has just been so delightful. So I have really nothing but just thank you for having this beautiful conversation so other people can like gain something from this, hopefully. Great, great. Well, thank you all. And thank, uh, thank you all who have uh, participated with us on LinkedIn Live. You're welcome to reach out if you have any specific questions that we can help you with and um, and happy uh, Women's History Month and happy Women's Future. How's that? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you.